Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Business Immigration Benchmark. I'm your host, Laura Blanares. Coming up on this episode, I'm super excited to welcome my friend and colleague, Audrey Lesgarden, Global Managing Partner here at WR Immigration. We're going to be diving into the most important global mobility trends worldwide here in 2024. We'll also dive into some relevant new changes and updates in the UK immigration system, and then wrap up by walking through a few global-specific scenarios together. Really quick before we jump in, if you haven't already, please follow the Business Immigration Benchmark on Spotify and subscribe to WR Immigration on YouTube. The best way to get a hold of Audrey and I after this episode is to DM us on LinkedIn. We're LinkedIn creatures these days. I also recommend listeners follow WR Immigration on LinkedIn to hear and listen to more content that our WR colleagues are posting and conversations they're leading on that platform. With that, I want to welcome Audrey. Audrey, welcome to the Business Immigration Benchmark. Can you share a little bit about you and your practice? Definitely. Thanks so much, Laura. Glad to be here. So a little bit about me. I have been in the global immigration field for about 17 years now, time flies, focusing my practice exclusively on a non-U.S. immigration, specifically business immigration. And I lead the team at, at WR uh, that covers about 100 countries, just over 100 countries now outside of the U.S. So really just helping our clients get their employees or hire the talent they need wherever in the world they find themselves. I know I'm glad you're on our team because whenever someone has one of those crazy questions, it's like, I don't know the answer, but Audrey does. Um, and you do. So I really appreciate working with you. That's what, that's my every day. The, the at Audrey, I don't know, but where is this country? Um, how, do I, how do I go about getting permission to work? Exactly. So Audrey, let's talk about what you view as some of the trends and challenges for global mobility teams to keep an eye on this year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's things are moving pretty fast these days. I feel like post pandemic, the world has just opened up and business is is going a little crazy. So hard to choose kind of the top trends, but I would say companies are really facing challenges with the pace of business travel and short term assignment. I think that a lot of my global mobility managers and HR professionals are coping with employees that want to work as tourists, basically. You know, they've got important business meetings, they've got important work to do in other countries. It's very time sensitive. They just want to jump on a plane and go and get the work done and make the money. And nobody wants to wait around to, to get the visa that they should have you know, deal with a lot of U.S. nationals. And as we know, we're very privileged. You know, there are a lot of places in the world that we could just jump on a plane with our passport and go in as a tourist, you know, without needing a visa. Of course, the problem is if we are doing that when we are actually going for business or going for some sort of short-term assignment where we are doing productive work on behalf of our employer, that's not allowed. You know, tourism and business are not the same thing. And I think that a lot of global mobility and HR professionals really are facing an uphill battle at the moment as just the volume and the pace of, of travel increases and trying to keep up with it and keep track of their employees and make sure that people are aware that immigration compliance is really important and you might need a visa before you get on that plane. And if you don't have one, you might run into problems. I mean, we are seeing people being denied entry, people being fined, you know, business is getting in trouble, individuals getting in trouble. And so it's it's a challenge that I see at my work just about every day. And so what are some things that you're seeing your clients, the companies do to successfully like rein in some of this chaotic travel, right? So yeah. understand that their, their top people, their technical folks need to hop on that next plane what yeah. are some successful programs doing to sort of rein that in, at least know if they're going on the plane or not without the right <laughs> permit? Yeah. I think just setting up systems and processes is so important. And especially for the very large companies that are very busy and have people going a million different places, you've got to have systems and processes in, in place to cope with that. It's going to take different 
formats, depending on the needs of the the company and the nature of the travel, but having something that ideally connects with your travel booking so that it's flagged in that process. You know, there's a step in that process that says, you know, visa immigration compliance. And we've helped some clients develop processes that they can put into place where, you know, we have business travel assessment forms both built into our rabbit system and also, you know, manual, or we can help them configure the the systems that they're already using so that there is just an established process that all these people that need to travel, they go through one step in that process. In addition to, you know, booking your flight and booking your hotel, hopefully before those things is, you know, where are you going? What are you going to do there? What's your citizenship so that we can do an assessment of, you know, do you need a visa? What type of visa do you need? What's the lead time on this? And having that system or process, so it's almost like self-service where the, the traveler is filling out that information and then it's funneling to, to us or to whoever needs to look at it rather than, you know, HRs or global mobility professionals trying to chase people around and remind them that they should be submitting information and they should be getting an assessment. The, the more that you can really build it into the system you already have in place for, for planning and booking travel, I think the lower the burden is on the, the global mobility team in terms of, you know, having to keep track of, of everyone. Uh, but I do think education is important and we will often do, uh, you know, town halls or, you know, webinars for clients that are aimed more at managers and at employees and really educating them because some of them are doing this because they just honestly don't know. I mean, some of them know better and they're getting on the plane anyway. Uh, but some of them just honestly don't have this this information and don't realize how much trouble you can run into both on an individual level and for the company uh, when you start trying to travel without the, the right visa. Cool. So it sounds like what I'm hearing is a successful program has a couple of things in place, like a coupled protocol with whenever travel is being booked or worked at, that there is a sort of preceding protocol about vetting or assessing need for work authorization visa support. Yeah. And then the second piece is education. And so that's maybe a continuing sort of multiple check-ins per year to kind of just refresh everybody's memory, new people join. Yeah. Get get that information front of mind so everybody's aware, like an awareness piece. Absolutely. When when someone's getting denied entry, like what I'm sure there's like an emergency workflow, but like, how does the company deal with that when someone's denied entry? Like how, how have you seen companies respond in those situations? <laughs> well, sometimes it takes the form of me getting a call on my cell phone on Sunday afternoon, depending where in the world they're being denied entry and the, the time zones and all of that. I mean, yeah, usually it turns into an emergency workflow. To be honest, you know, pretty much all clients panic a bit when this when this happens. You know, it is it's upsetting for the traveler. It's upsetting for everyone that's involved for them not to be able to get in. And you know, they've just flown all the way to I don't know Barcelona or Sydney or something like that's a very long flight. You're going to be coming back on, and it is it's painful. But I mean, they deal with it usually by by engaging us to to troubleshoot and see, you know, is there something sometimes we can deal with it at the port of entry, we can send someone we can work through it if there is some legal way for them to enter. If it's a clear cut case of like, they're just not eligible to enter without this visa, and they're going home, then we're looking at, you know, how can we mitigate any long term impact of that? And, you know, how can we usually turn around and get an application filed for the correct visa so that they can, obviously, not immediately, but once they have that, make the trip. Or depending on, you know, the time sensitivity of it and the impact on the person that's been denied entry, the, the client might look at another traveler that can travel with the correct visa and, and meet the needs that they have there. But yeah, it's, it's an emergency kind of triage situation. Don't envy your work hours. Um, so... <laughs> What about, can you tell us a little bit about more international remote work requests? I feel like, you know, post pandemic, we have all these new and fun, but for a business compliance perspective, challenging remote work requests. So how are you, your clients deal, wrestle with that? What's, what's that looking like from a compliance perspective for you? Yeah, international remote work is still a bit of a nightmare for my clients to, to be honest. 
you know, they want to compete for top talent. They want to retain their employees. So they're, they're wanting to, you know, do what they can to honor these requests. But it's really challenging for a company from a compliance perspective to have all these, you know, people wanting to work remotely, either from a single country or, you know, gone around the world tour of fabulous, you know, tropical destinations during the winter or something like that. And I think employees just really, again, there's an education piece to it that we can help support our clients with. They just don't think about it. They they see, you know, the the glossy advertisements and they see digital nomad visas and it doesn't matter. You can just come and work and they don't realize what a burden that is for the company and for the global mobility professionals that, that work there where, you know, they've got a bet, even if you manage to get yourself a digital nomad visa or come to your company and you know, talk them into having us support the employee getting additional nomad visa, which some do, you've still got to deal with employment law, you've still got to deal with tax. And a lot of times these digital nomad programs that were developed during the pandemic, they were not thought through all the way. So they have problems. And it's not necessarily like you might have a a program where, okay, from an immigration perspective, you can get the visa really easily, but then they didn't think about what the tax rules are, and it totally clashes. You know, there was a situation for a while in Spain where like one of the documents you needed for the digital nomad visa is a tax related document, but you actually can't get it unless you have a company. I mean, it was just a, it was a hot mess and looking at it, it was like, okay, we kept getting inquiries. Like I want to go work in Spain. It's beautiful. It's lovely. They've got a digital nomad program and you're like, yes, but social security and you can't actually get this. And it's, it's a disaster. Um, so I think for companies, I encourage them to try to kind of corral the chaos a little bit by offering like a menu of options for if they if they want to support international remote work, which not all companies do. Some have just said, no, come back to the office or find a new job. But the, the companies that do want to support international remote work can offer a menu of options in terms of the countries where they're able to allow people to work remotely. And that allows the the global mobility professional or the HR to pre-vet those countries with us as immigration counsel, with their tax counsel, with their employment counsel and say, okay, these countries, you know, these five countries, eight countries, 10 countries, whatever it is, we've vetted, we know what's required to be compliant there. We can do it with a minimum burden and cost on the company. And so if you get those requests, like, oh, I want to work international, I want to work remote. Okay, here are the, your choices. Then you're not getting like constant new countries thrown at you and every single time having to go through a due diligence process to see if that's possible. Because that's a really big burden on global mobility professionals that already have an awful lot on their plate. Yeah, I think the menu options is smart and it is meeting the, it's a balance between meeting the employee request or demands versus, you know, efficiency and compliance. And those are always, yeah, can be at odds, but I think the menu kind of meets, meets everybody in a, in a really kind, compassionate and thoughtful way. Yeah. It, it shows that you care about your employees. You're trying to, you know, accommodate their desires, but you can't just be a free for all that's, you yeah. know, unlimited time and budget spent on international remote work. Yeah. And then, you know, I know that in the U.S. we're seeing increasing costs of immigration sponsorship as a challenge for 2024. Can you tell me how that plays out in the global space? Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing the same trend. Um, I don't think I've seen anyone decrease government fees for immigration related processes. They only go in one direction. Uh, Depends on the country, how rapidly they go in in that direction. I would say that here the, the U.K. really has the the spotlight. Government fees in the UK have really gone up significantly. There was an initial increase a few months back, and then the immigration health surcharge increased just uh, a few weeks ago now. And so the, the government fees for a skilled worker visa, which is the most common work visa type in the UK, it can range from around 9,000 US dollars equivalent to uh, just over twenty thousand dollars. Wow! Just in in government fees for a, a single worker, and you know, obviously, if they're accompanied by a spouse, by children, fees are being charged for for those individuals as well. And the fee is being charged per year of stay that you're requesting. So a one year visa will be cheaper than a five year visa, but it's all really quite quite expensive. You can easily get 
you know, for a family relocating to the UK, you can get into tens of thousands of dollars in, in government filing fees just to get their visas. And so when did these fees go into effect? So some of them uh, started in the fall, and then the immigration health surcharge just recently, just a few weeks ago, went up. So we were we were rushing to get a few few cases filed in advance of the the fee increase. As I know you all have been on the U.S. side as well. Like anytime the fees are going up, it's a scramble to get things filed. Are you starting to see any decrease in movement to the U.K.? I don't know if it's too soon or if you're already starting to see companies pivot strategy. No, I think it definitely is a consideration. I mean, we have had clients that it's not uncommon for, you know, once we're quoting the the government fees and laying out all the costs that they're like, you know what, this this just isn't feasible for us. This wasn't something that we built into the the budget. So I think there's always a, a period of adjustment. You know, we've done alerts about it. There's been press coverage of it. But as clients are like actually starting to, to realize how much more it's going to cost them, to send people versus what they've paid in the past and, and what they might have budgeted. We're definitely seeing some hesitation there. And clients considering other jurisdictions, you know, to the extent that they have a choice, sure. um, going to other locations in, in Europe, for example, if they've got an office in Madrid or they've got an office in Amsterdam in addition to London, well, you know, can we base this person out of that office rather than the the London office? It's it's definitely a consideration because the the UK fees are just so much higher than than other countries. I mean, Spain it's a couple hundred dollars, and then you right. look and you know it's tens of thousands of dollars in the UK. That does make a difference to the bottom line, especially when you've got a significant population of, of foreign nationals to to employ. No kidding. Well, that allows us to transition nicely into our next segment here, where we're going to spotlight the UK and talk a bit more about the specific changes that the country has made, in addition to just their fee hikes to their immigration system in total. So UK government fees are way up, um, but what else is going on there? Yeah, the UK is is not um, the, the best place for immigration at the moment, sadly, Laura. They have a program to try to reduce overall immigration numbers. There was a lot of press attention, political attention to what people considered to be, you know, excessive numbers of of immigrants coming into the UK, which is really too bad because there are a lot of labor shortages there. And some of these cuts are just really going to have a detrimental impact on the the sectors that that need employees the most. It's unfortunate, but yes, they have a, a five prong plan to reduce overall immigration numbers. It is, you know, as in many countries, uh, uh, largely a political thing. But they have increased their their version of the prevailing wage. They call it the going rate or the the wage that has to be paid to someone that's being sponsored for a skilled worker visa. They increased it from just over 26,000 pounds to just over 38,000 pounds as the floor. But you have to be paid either that or whatever is the going rate for your occupation. So you can't, you know, hire someone in a a senior specialized role and pay them that amount. You have to look at at the going rates. Those have just all been bumping up and up and impacting uh, some of our clients in, in terms of the wage rates that, that have to be paid. They also decreased the number of occupations that are on what used to be called the shortage list. It's now, I believe, uh, called the, the immigration salary list, a list of you know shortage occupations where more workers were needed that could be paid a, a lower going rate wage. Um, they reduced the number of occupations on that. And they really exponentially increased the fines for non-compliant employers. So the fines for legal work for the first penalty or the first breach went from around 15,000 pounds to 45,000 pounds. Wow. And then for second and subsequent breaches, it goes from 20,000 now up to 60,000 pounds. So really serious penalties for violations. And that can be inadvertent violations. You're not doing your your right to work checks thoroughly. You know, there's a mistake or a misunderstanding. It's not just for folks that are, you know, willfully bringing in a whole bunch of foreign nationals and, and knowingly employing them illegally. So it's, it's not 
the best time in, in the UK from an immigration perspective. Yeah, I mean, it sounds a lot of doom and gloom. Um, are there any positive <laughs> changes happening in the UK? A few. Um, one really nice surprise we got was so companies in the UK in order to sponsor foreign nationals have to get a sponsor license for their company, which is kind of a, a big undertaking for them to go through the process, get the license, prove that the the company is genuine and has sufficient funds to pay the workers and will comply with all the the sponsorship obligations. It's a heavy lift to get that initially, and then you used to have to renew it, but we got a pleasant surprise that sponsor licenses are now going to be valid indefinitely, so companies won't be having to apply to to renew them over and over again. It's just that initial application, which is which is really quite nice. Of course, it's still important to keep up with all of the, you know, reporting obligations, you know, keeping your license current, if you're changing your, the address, if the conditions of employment of someone you've sponsored are changing, there's still definitely an obligation to keep up to date with that and report what you're supposed to be reporting because they will most definitely still take that sponsor license away if you're not keeping up with it. But at least you don't have to renew it all the time like like you used to. And then the other thing that I would say is really nice about the UK is that priority processing is really widely available. You know, in an urgent situation, we can potentially get someone work visa within 48 hours. It's going to cost a lot in terms of government fees. They have a very hefty priority processing fee for that super fast turnaround. But it's nice that it's available because sometimes we've got clients in those urgent situations and it's it's really good to have an option. It's so important that the person gets there from a business perspective that it's worth it to spend the money. So it's nice to see a country that's actually offering an option for for when companies need it. Totally. Okay, so fees, political situation, a lot of challenges in the UK. I'd love to run through some scenarios to kind of highlight, you know, challenges you're seeing play out with companies you're working through, things you consult on. So these are real world scenarios. We've anonymized facts and figures to just highlight how companies are wrestling with global mobility, global work permits, and how Audrey advises in these types of scenarios. So you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Scenario one, a head of immigration and mobility has been informed that their company needs to bring on a large number of software engineers in the UK and Ireland this year, where the business is growing rapidly. So this is the AI industry, years of experience. Head of Immigration Mobility has 10 years. They have three team members globally. Their vendors are large multinational immigration law firm and other vendors. Their foreign national employee population is 1,200 plus. Their 2024 pain points, cost containment, lead time to get new hires, employment authorized. So our question here for Audrey is, what should the head of Immigration and Mobility be considering when deciding where to place the software engineers, the UK or Ireland? And what should they be advising recruiters that are sourcing the talent? Good question. So I think the the head of immigration and mobility should be considering, given particularly their pain points, they should be considering the cost and the lead time. And I would say also, obviously, the qualification requirements in the UK versus Ireland in terms of getting a, a work visa. In the UK, they'd be looking at skilled work visa in Ireland, they would be looking at some sort of an employment permit. There's there's a few different types available, but I would really encourage them to to work with their multinational immigration law firm to do a compare and contrast. You know, a lot of times in in situations like this, we will prepare kind of a, a cheat sheet comparison chart so they can see kind of what their options are and they can weigh the pros and cons. Here, if they are focused on cost savings, Ireland is going to be the the place to be, at least in terms of government immigration filing fees. You know, you're looking at around a thousand euros for for filing fees for most of those employment permit types in Ireland and comparing that to, you know, 10,000 plus in the UK, Ireland comes out the clear winner there in terms of, of just government costs to get them work authorized. In terms of timing, the UK potentially could come out ahead, particularly if they're wanting to use that priority processing, depending on where where in the world the, the software engineers are, are being sourced. If they're already in the UK, it's a little different versus if they're outside the UK. But, you know, they really, if the priority is speed and they want to 
get work visas for these folks in 48 hours and, and cost is not as much of a concern, then they could go for the UK. I would see in scenarios like this, usually, you know, where it's, they're planning ahead, they're going to need to ramp up their software engineer hiring. Usually cost is a significant factor. And so I would see a, a client like this and probably advise them to, to go towards Ireland rather than the UK, just because, you know, those, those costs add up exponentially if they're bringing on a lot of folks. And I think that in terms of, you know, eligibility, software engineers generally don't have a difficult time qualifying under either the employment permit or the, the UK skilled worker visa. So it's, it's kind of a toss up there. Obviously, we would do an assessment to, to make sure there are no pain points, no, no red flags, you know, is the salary okay, looking at, you know, their versions of the, the going rate or the prevailing wage. So sometimes those points can steer them towards one one country or another. But just at a high level, looking at this, I would encourage them to, to head for Ireland, really do that comparison and, and that'll help them to to make an informed decision. Perfect. Okay, scenario two. A director of immigration is leading global mobility program that is running well for new hires and long-term assignments, but she's experiencing overwhelming demand for business travel and short-term assignments as the company's international business has grown exponentially post-pandemic. Here's the info we have on her and her company for a consulting firm. She has 15 years of experience. Her internal team size is 12 members globally. Her vendors are large multinational immigration law firms and other vendors. The total foreign national employees under management is 4,000 plus. The 2024 pain points, cost containment, compliance, high volume of business travel, outdated case management system. Our question here are two employees were recently denied entry to Australia due to not holding the appropriate work visas for their three-week consulting project there. This has led to leadership having an appetite for addressing immigration compliance globally, and the director now needs to propose a solution that is both efficient and compliant to get their business traveler situation under control. What do you recommend for this director? <laughs> Never fun being denied entry to Australia, particularly if you are coming from the U.S. That's a very long flight to be coming back on. I think that, you know, for this director, I would encourage her to partner with her law firm, partner with her provider to, to see what tools are available to, to help her. Because as we talked about earlier in the episode, the director of immigration and, and her internal bubble mobility team just trying to to chase people around, making sure that they have the visas they need before they get on the plane. I mean, especially if you've got a volume like this, that's just going to be incredibly difficult without having a system and a process for it. So she really needs to get a support team in place and get a process in place where before these travelers are booking travel or at a minimum as part of the travel booking process, they are being required to submit information about their trip and that that is being evaluated by the law firm to see, you know, do they need a visa? If they do, what type of visa? What's the lead time? And putting the brakes on their ability to travel until they've been able to, to obtain the visa. And then you're forestalling these situations where people are denied entry. It's a surprise. You know, Australia is it's actually a pretty good jurisdiction from uh, a short-term assignment perspective. They've got the subclass 400. It's a short-term work visa. You can get it within a matter of a couple of weeks generally. So if they had just known these people were traveling, they probably could have easily fixed the situation and gotten them the, the visas that, that they need. So I think just having that system in place where the, the facts of the travel are being vetted before the employee books or definitely before they, they get on the plane. And then having a follow through solution, uh, you know, some companies bifurcate this, you know, having us handle the more complex cases, the work visa cases, and then they have a, a visa provider, business visa provider once it's vetted that, okay, yes, they need a visa, but it's just a business visa. That could be an option for, for cost containment or for some clients, they prefer that, that we handle it all, you know, so that it is a seamless process from the assessment of what they need down through the delivery of the actual visa that they need to get on that plane. Quick question, follow up on that. When you're denied entry to Australia, are there repercussions on, you know, a future immigration benefit? Unfortunately, there are, Laura. That's going to be part of your record, the individual's record in Australia. 
that they were denied entry. So if they turn up again without a visa, that's a problem. And they're always going to have that, you know, potential to be pulled into secondary and asked more questions and kind of be doubted as to the purpose that they're coming to Australia. So they'll need to be very, very careful that they have any future trips to Australia, even if it's just a holiday with their family that they have over-documented exactly why they're there, what they're going to be doing. And unfortunately, it can affect them actually in other countries as well, because there are a lot of countries out there that will ask if you've ever been denied admission or deported from any country, not just the country you're applying for. So it, it can unfortunately follow them, which is why it's really important to try to have that system in place to catch these things before people get on the plane. Yeah, they might be really grounded in the future. <laughs> Yeah, it's not fun. And especially if it's a key employee that's a frequent traveler, it's really, really not fun. No kidding. Okay, final scenario, scenario three. A global mobility specialist is leading a video gaming company that expects a significant number of new hires through 2024. The markets they are in are quite competitive and sourcing new talent is a challenge for the recruitment team. Here's the info we have on her and her company. So we're in the IT industry. The global mobility specialist has 12 years of experience, internal team size, six members globally. Their vendors are large multinational immigration law firm and other vendors. Total foreign national employees under management are 1,000. The 2024 pain points are sourcing talents, compliance, cost containment. The question here is both existing and prospective employees are continuing to push the company to allow them to work remotely, in particular from other countries. Dealing with these requests is time-consuming and frustrating for the global mobility specialist as she is repeatedly having to explain why international remote work is a compliance issue and is under pressure from managers and recruiters who want to retain and attract the best talent. How can she address the situation to reduce the burden on her and her team while meeting business needs to retain and recruit talent. So I think this goes back to potentially offering a a menu of options. You know, I'd really recommend that this global mobility specialist maybe take a look at the international remote work requests she's received over the past six months, 12 months, whatever time period, and see if we can identify patterns of where people are are wanting to work. Sometimes we find that, you know, there is a real pattern, there's a demand for a particular set of, of countries. And then, you know, working collaboratively with her, we can come up with, okay, what what is possible? What are the options? You know, is this a country that offers a, a digital nomad visa that is very straightforward and that doesn't have a lot of other issues that play into it from a a tax or an employment perspective, or is this a really difficult country and help her to come up with a menu of options, assuming that it sounds, you know, it sounds like since they're really competing for talent and they're in the IT industry, you know, it's likely that they are going to want to try to accommodate requests if they can do so in a compliant way. So we could help her to vent, like develop that menu of options that she can then offer to the team. And we could also help her out Uh, You know, it sounds like she is feeling like a broken record, explaining over and over again that that this is a compliance issue and it's not as easy as just saying, sure, you can work from, you know, insert whatever country you want, but that, you know, there's a process that the company has to follow. They have to make sure that they're going to be compliant from an immigration perspective, probably a tax and employment perspective as well. So we could do, you know, a town hall or even a recording that that she can share with managers and employees that kind of break down these issues and kind of help her educate her population there so that hopefully she is getting fewer questions about this and she has a ready-made menu of options to to offer them. I'd also encourage her just from a management perspective, you know, most clients that are going to go to the trouble of this are also developing policies on international remote work. And, you know, some will use it like a performance reward or, you know, like there are certain criteria in terms of like how long the employee's been with the company or their performance scores on their review or something else as to who can qualify to go and do remote work. Because most most companies, you know, right when they're hiring new employees aren't wanting to to offer everything all at once, but are wanting to have it as an incentive that that people can can work towards. Yeah, as a benefit for tenured employees. Exactly. Any final thoughts, Audrey, on you know what you're seeing and what you're predicting to be 2024 
global trends in, in the mobility industry? Yeah, I mean, I think just what we've already talked about, Laura, and maybe I'd add to that, you know, the other thing that we are seeing is just a lot of applications going online. You know, we've been talking about Australia, they've been digital forever, but we're seeing more and more countries follow that introducing, you know, e visas or online processing. So that's a that's another trend to watch out for. Uh, and I think that's just going to to continue. It can be a beautiful thing when it works great. When the tech is functioning, it's amazing. You know, you get an emailed approval instead of having to go down and stand in line, you know, in the cold or wherever you are outside a consulate to get your visa. Everybody loves it. The downside is when the tech doesn't work. As we all know, that can cause twice as much pain uh, because then you're trying to troubleshoot something and trying to actually reach a human being that is hopefully some somehow involved in the process behind the scenes. Right. Uh, but that can be can be a challenge. So I'd say that's one more trend to to watch for in in 2024 that we're really seeing ramping up. Well, thank you, and I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you for future updates in the global space. Audrey, thanks for joining us on the Business Immigration Benchmark. Thanks for having me. Wrapping up here, episodes are released every Monday on Spotify and on WR Immigration's YouTube channel. So if you haven't, please follow, subscribe to us on those platforms. The best way to check in with Audrey or I is to drop us a DM on LinkedIn. So if you have questions, comments, feedback on this episode, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for joining us here on the Business Immigration Benchmark.